This week, we are considering the legitimate restriction to freedom of expression under international human rights standard. The question we are asking is under which condition can restricting free speech be legitimate? The answer to these questions may be found in the provision itself regarding freedom of expression, which includes the so-called three-part test. In the previous segments, we have reviewed the first two steps, legality and the valid grounds. In this segment, we will consider the third step, the test of necessity, which by all definition is probably the most important one in uh, that three-part test. Let's recall again the text of the provision and you can see that on your screen. The exercise of the right provided for in paragraph two of this article carries with it special duties and responsibilities. It may therefore be subject to certain restrictions, but these shall only be as such as are provided by law and are necessary, and then the list of valid ground. The test of necessity has been uh, the object of much more extensive and elaborate jurisprudence around the world. The question courts and observers have asked is when is a restriction to freedom of expression necessary? Necessary for what? And what do we mean by necessary? So in this segment, I will try to answer these questions. And broadly speaking, the test of necessity involves considering the following questions. And again, these are on your screen as I speak. First question, is the government acting in response to a pressing social need? That question is meant to ensure that the restriction on freedom of expression has not been adopted merely out of convenience. It is a question that is quite central to the European court uh, jurisprudence because the provision itself related to freedom of expression, Article 10, does make reference to social need and this is not a reference that you find in, for instance, Article 19 of the ICCPR. Nevertheless, even when evaluating uh, Article 19 restrictions, the question must be whether or not the restrictions is indispensable, meaning really responding to a pressing needs. In deciding uh, that question, the European Court has also considered the public interest in a case. If the information to be restricted relates to a matter of public concern, it would be necessary to demonstrate that it was certain that dissemination would damage the legitimate purpose identified. The public interest issues and concern mean that the necessity test uh, is particularly difficult to, uh, to be matched. Second question related to the test of necessity. Is the limitation impairing the right as little as possible or does it restrict speech in a broad and untargeted way? The nature of the restriction proposed is an important consideration. The Human Rights Committee of the United Nations has stated that restriction on freedom of expression may not put in jeopardy the right itself. So that's an important issue, the one that goes to the heart of the spirit of the, uh, of the right. The right cannot be restricted, the spirit of the right cannot be so restricted as to delete the nature of the right. Thirdly, are there alternative measures which would accomplish the same goal in ways less intrusive to freedom of expression? That's an important question and we will uh, look at how it's being implemented in one specific case later on. And the fourth question that court may ask is, does the harm to freedom of expression caused by the restriction outweigh the benefits to the interest it is directed at protecting. So if a restriction is protecting the right of others, does the restriction to freedom of expression outweigh the benefit to the interest of the right of others? 
This is largely a question or test of proportionality, meaning the restriction must be proportionate to the interest it is seeking to protect. That particular question on the proportionality of the restrictions has been again the object of much elaboration and discussion. The United Nations Human Rights Committee has stated, and I quote, the principle of proportionality must take account of the form of expression at issue as well as the means of its dissemination. For instance, the value placed by the covenant upon uninhibited expression is particularly high in the context of public debate in a democratic society concerning figures in the public and political domain. The principle of proportionality has to be respected not only in the law that frames the restriction, but also by the administrative and judicial authorities that are applying the law. In other words, the principle of proportionality should be present at every step of the restrictions, from the moment a law is being drafted and enacted, a law that uh, embodies restrictions, to the moment it is going to be implemented by any public actors. The European Court of Human Rights has stated that, and I quote again, inherent in the wall of the European Convention is a search for a fair balance between the demands of the general interest of the community and the requirement of the protection of the individual's fundamental rights. And here the European Court is uh, bringing a different light on the principle of proportionality, which is the balancing between two interests, two rights. Going back again to those four questions, the onus for all of them is on the state to demonstrate that the restrictions taken was necessary. What it means is that in any given case, the state must demonstrate in specific fashion the precise nature of the threat to any of the grounds listed in paragraph 3 that has caused it to restrict freedom of expression and the necessity and proportionality of the restriction in particular by establishing a direct and immediate connection between the expression and the threat, between the expression and the right it is seeking to protect, between the expression and the interest it is seeking to protect. To illustrate the necessity test, we are going to look at some cases from the international jurisprudence. We will begin by a case from the Human Rights Committee, Brodovic versus Serbia and Montenegro. Mr. Brodozik is a well-known journalist and a magazine editor. And in a magazine article published in 2002, the author politically criticized a number of individuals, including somebody called Mr. Segert. At the time the article was published, Mr. Segert was a manager of a factory, but previously he had been a prominent member of the Socialist Party of Serbia including leader of the party group in the federal Yugoslav parliament in 2001. In the article, the journalist Brodozik accused Segert of slandering money and he used fairly disparaging terms to describe uh, Mr. Segert. That person, Mr. Segert, filed suit for insult and libel. The first court dismissed the libel charge on the basis that the factual aspect of the article were in fact true and correct. But the court found the journalist guilty of insult on the basis that the article was actually abusive and inflicted damage to the honor and reputation of the private plaintiff. He just got uh, 10,000 Yugoslav dinars as a fine and that conviction was upheld on appeal. Eventually, the case reached the UN Human Rights Committee. The journalist, Mr. Brodozik, alleged that his criminal conviction for the article violate his right under Article 19 to freedom of expression. 
and he seeks a declaration of violation of Article 19 and recommendations that Serbia and Montenegro decriminalize libel and insult. So what does the committee do, the Human Rights Committee? It goes back to Article 19, paragraph 3, which permits restriction on freedom of expression if they are provided by law for respect of the right or reputation of others and are necessary. So the committee goes through each one of the case. It observes that the state party, Serbia and Montenegro, has advanced no justification for the prosecution and conviction of the author on charges of criminal insult. Basically, the state has not demonstrated why the prosecution was necessary for the protection of the right and reputation of Mr. Segert. The committee found factual element and the expression of opinion by the journalist in the article and that article referring to a prominent public and political figure. Thus, the committee found it difficult to discern how the reporting of fact and of an opinion amounted to an unjustified infringement of Mr. Seger's right and reputation, much less one calling for the application of criminal sanction. The committee furthermore observes that in circumstances of public debate in a democratic society, especially in the media, concerning figures in the public domain, the value placed by the covenant is particularly high. The value placed by the covenant on expression is particularly high. It follows that the author's conviction and sentence in the present case amounted to a violation of Article 19. So with this ruling, the Human Rights Committee has questioned the pressing need that the restriction was seeking to address. And it also uh, determined that the government is under the honors to demonstrate each of the, of the step and that the Serbian government had not done. The Human Rights Committee also highlighted again the expression that the expression of public debate in a democratic society is particularly important and must be as uninhibited as possible. Let's consider another case as Shin versus Republic of Korea. Mr. Shin is a, is a professional artist. He painted a picture which was subsequently seized by the South Korean authority under the term of Article 7 of the National Security Law on the ground that it benefited an enemy. It was alleged that the image of the painting depicted the South Korean regime as corrupt and militaristic and attempted to show the desirability of a structural change. Basically, it amounted to an incitement to, and I cite, communization of the Republic of Korea. The author, Mr. Shin, was convicted under the term of the national security law is painting being deemed a form of expression that was actively and aggressively threatening the security of the country and the democratic order. So the Human Rights Committee reviewed the case and stated that the author's painting clearly fell within the scope of the forms of expression protected by Article 19. The committee noted that the state party submission did not attempt to identify which of the purpose identified in Article 19.3 were applicable to the restriction they had imposed on the author's right to freedom of art, much less the necessity of imposing the restrictions. The committee accepted that South Korea had identified a national security basis for the confiscation of the painting. However, South Korea was also required to demonstrate the precise nature of the threats caused by the author's painting to any of the purpose listed in Article 3. Basically, how does the painting 
threaten national security was a question that the committee asked South Korea. And of course, South Korea did not really have an answer to that question. And therefore, it was held unanimously that there had been a violation of Article 19. With that particular case, the Human Rights Committee stated or reinstated that when a state party invokes a legitimate ground for restriction of freedom of expression, it must demonstrate in specific and individualized fashion the precise nature of the threat and the necessity and proportionality of the specific action taken. In particular, by establishing a direct and immediate connection between the expression and the threat. That South Korea had not done. Let's turn now to a recent and quite complex case at the Inter-American Court. Omar Humberto Maldonado versus Chile. It deals with the scope of the right of access to information collected during processes of transitional justice. So the case is on the right to access to information contained in Truth Commission archives on human rights violation. In the case in question, the court had to rule on whether one of the Truth Commission created during Chile's transition to democracy was required to turn over information from its archives to judges investigating the human rights violation committed during the dictatorship. The Chilean court had denied the request, thus imposing a restriction on freedom of expression and information. The Inter-American court applied the three-part test and it found A, the restriction was authorized by law and it sought two legitimate ends the Truth Commission ability to complete the task it had been charged with, and two, the protection of the individuals who gave testimony before the Commission. For the Inter-American Court, as for the Chilean Court, in this case, confidentiality was necessary to be able to reconstruct the historic narrative. So the Court basically balanced the need of confidentiality in order to reconstruct the historical narrative during the dictatorship with the freedom of expression and information for um, justice purposes. The Inter-American Court ruled that the restrictions against freedom of expression was proportionate because A, it had a time limit and two, the individuals who testified before the commission could also give their testimony to judges if they so choose. So what the Inter-American Court found is that yes, the information provided to the Truth Commission was kept confidential. On the other hand, that does not stop people who gave testimony to the, to the, um, to the archives from also going to the judge and repeating their testimony. Finally, the court noted that the state itself was revising its access to information procedures for all those cases related to that particular painful period. And so according to the judgment handed over by the Inter-American Court, it is legitimate in these cases to withhold information as long as doing so is based on a legal provision seek a legitimate end and is necessary and strictly proportional for accomplishing that goal. So to sum up and in conclusion, international standard related to freedom of expression, whether under Article 19 of the ICCPR or under the regional conventions, allow for limitation to the right to freedom of expression and information. This is not an absolute right. To be legitimate, a restriction should meet a three-part test. One, the test of legality, meaning the restrictions must be enshrined in a law which is itself respectful of international human rights standard. Two, valid grounds. The restrictions must respond 
to legitimate grounds enunciated in the international or the regional standard. And three, the restrictions must be necessary. It must respond to a well-expressed and justified need, and it must be proportionate, meaning if there are alternative measures which would accomplish the same goals in less intrusive measures to freedom of expression, such measures should be adopted. Courts around the world rely on this test or some version of this test to assess restrictions to freedom of expression. However, the, um, the, the, the test itself is not implemented everywhere. In too many countries still, courts provide little elaboration on their reasoning as to why they uh, agree to a restrictions or rely on legal reasoning that are in fact politicized and with little bearing with international standard. That, of course, is detrimental to the rule of law in general, the protection of human rights and freedom of expression in particular. The three-part test is not an easy test to meet, but it does require that the authorities justify that their restrictions to freedom of expression and do so by reference to established procedures and uh, grounds. The discipline involved in this exercise benefit political governance, the legal profession and community, and of course society at large and freedom of expression.